This video has been sponsored by Squarespace, an all-in-one website platform for anyone trying to succeed online. What in the now? Kim Delic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I tried to introduce myself the Doflamingo way. <laughs> it was so bad. Anyway, I was at the Denny's with a goth girl, and she told me to do some crazy things. She said I should perform an ozonolysis, but without a reductive workup. She said I should do it on piperin, and if I did it correctly, then she would do something with maple syrup and under the table at Denny's. I don't, I don't really know what she meant, but I wanted to do it. Now, there's a paper talking about ozonolysis in a solvent water mixture without any need to isolate or decompose the ozonides. Now, I was also curious if there was a procedure already out there. Now, to start this process out, we need some acetone, and I put 300 milliliters into a beaker. You don't need to dry the acetone at all, as we're going to be putting water in here anyway. Now, the paper did say to use 5% water in acetone, but I had a viewer send me an email, and he used 10%, so I decided to use 10%. I also made a salted ice bath, and I'm going to put our beaker into that. Generally, ozonolysis reactions should be done in very, very cold temperatures, so I decided to recreate that, even if it's a little different. I also turned on stirring. To this, I'm going to add some piperin, and I'm going to add 12.63 grams. Piperin is normally extracted from black pepper, however, I really don't want to extract from a lot of black pepper, and I just decided to get this off of Amazon. My extraction yields were 100%. Piperin is easily dissolvable in acetone, and it shouldn't take too long to dissolve all of it. However, we are in an ice bath, so it might take a little bit longer, as lower temperatures decrease solubility. Of course the solution is yellow, so now we got that yellow chemistry going again. We just have to wait until this is fully clear. I want to stop the video really quick, and I want to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, and that's Squarespace.com. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for any entrepreneur to stand out and succeed online. And with their Fluid Engine, it's never been easier to unlock unbreakable creativity. You can design anything with their drag and drop technology. Plus, with their analytics, you can use insights to grow your own business. You can learn where your site visits are, your sales, and analyze which channels are most effective. Plus, they have third-party extensions where you can increase the functionality of your website. If you want all of this and more, head over to squarespace.com slash chemdelic to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using code chemdelic. Now that it's all dissolved, it's now time to crank that ozone into there. Once I put this into our solution, our ozonolysis will start to go underway. Now you're probably wondering, where the hell do I get an ozone generator? Amazon will hand deliver an ozone generator to your house. Who would have known that Jeff Bezos was chill like that? This really is the new age of at-home chemistry. Also, on a side note, they sell 30,000 milligrams an hour ozone generators. Might I add, overnight shipping and a 50% off coupon. God, I love Amazon. And because we're using ozone, I have ventilation. Once I turned the machine on, it started bubbling and our ozonolysis started to happen. I originally put this on for 4 hours as I thought, okay, this is a 1 to 1 mole ratio. Though, if you've already caught on, this isn't the best idea. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Though, I was also curious to see what would happen and the reaction just went on. So what's actually happening in this mechanism? Well, we're taking piperin and we're putting it in some acetone and water solution and then we're putting ozone into it. This kind of reaction is called an ozonolysis reaction, and you can think of ozone as a pair of scissors cutting a double bond. Normally when you think of an ozonolysis reaction, you think of the mechanism in this sort of way. In the first step of ozonolysis, ozone adds to the alkene in a concerted step known as a cycloaddition. This results in a new five-membered ring called a malozonide. Now, the malozonide is really unstable and it quickly undergoes a reverse cycloaddition. This results to give two fragments, one of which is a carbonyl oxide. Now, we do also get our product, however, something else happens. Well, it turns out that there's another cycloaddition where the two fragments recombine to give another five membered ring. This is called an ozonide, which has an ether linkage and a peroxide. Now this isn't intermediate, and upon warming, 
ozonides will break down to give aldehydes and ketones. Now, there is a peroxide in there, and organic peroxides can't be quite, you know. It's best to keep them in a dilute solution, and pretty cold, and then reduce them with dimethyl sulfide. Though in our case, it's a little bit different. I found this proposed mechanism in a paper that I linked in the description, and it actually goes over some really interesting things. Basically, you could do an ozonolysis of alkenes in a mixture of water and a water miscible organic solvent that achieved a fast, convenient, and efficient one pot synthesis of aldehydes and ketones without the need for a separate reductive step. Now, if you're confused on why they used only 5% of water, well, the addition of water to carbonyl oxides is believed to generate a gem hydroperoxy alcohol, which for most substrates decomposes with liberation of the aldehyde or ketone and hydrogen peroxide. And that's essentially where we get our piperonol from. Now, there are other side products, but they're water soluble. Now, piperonol isn't really water soluble, so it makes it pretty easy if we just pour some water in and we can just filter it out. And let's get back to me doing that. Now, also on a side note, the procedure was a little confusing because it said to extract with diethyl ether once the ozone was shut off. Though acetone and ether are miscible. So I have no idea how they did that. I don't know if they broke the laws of chemistry or I'm just reading this wrong, but I'm just really confused how they did that. I think what they did was they just poured a bunch of water in there to crash out the piperonol and everything else that it cleaved off by the ozonolysis was water soluble and then they extracted with the ether. Though it would just be easier to crash out with water and then filter it, which is what I'm going to do. So I took our solution and I put it into a bigger beaker so I could crash out the piperonol. I didn't exactly know how much water I was going to need, so that's the only reason why I got a bigger beaker. It's also not that orange, that's just the color grading. I also turned on stirring, but there really wasn't any need to do that. As I start to pour the water in, we see a white precipitate come out of the solution. This should be our piperonol, and I was very happy to see this. Or the reaction didn't work, and I was very sad. Though I got this beautiful vanillin cherry smell, which is a characteristic of piperonol. Once I felt like nothing else came out when I poured water in, I decided to do a vacuum filtration. As I was doing the vacuum filtration, that beautiful aroma became more pronounced, and it was really, really good to smell. Now, it looks like we have a lot, but it's also quote-unquote fluffy, and the second I pull the vacuum, it all condenses together. I also decided to wash it out with water, as we don't want any hydrogen peroxide or any other impurities to be in there. And this is what our product looks like. However, there's some yellow splotches, and it looks kind of grainy. I really wasn't expecting this, and it kind of threw me off. It looked like there was some piperin that still hasn't reacted. Or, something else happens. I was thinking about it, and I had one of those like, oh, I'm actually stupid moments, and I think I figured it out. I'm not sure why, but I only thought about it from that one double bond perspective. And there's two double bonds where it could break, so I originally calculated how much ozone we would need from the amount of piperin that we used and the molar amounts. I think it was originally around three and a half hours that I needed for one double bond, but I went up to four hours just for a little excess. So theoretically, we would only need another four hours to make sure both of those bonds were cleaved. So I redissolved everything and I performed another four hour ozonolysis. The difference is vast. This looks a lot more uniform and I can't really see any yellow splotches. It was also a lot more fluffier when I first put the water in to crash out the piperonol. I'm definitely a lot more happy with this result compared to the last one. Now, all I have to do is dry it and then perform a melting point test. The melting point test is very good because piperonol's melting point is between 35 and 39 degrees Celsius, while piperin is 130 degrees Celsius. Now, our sample actually started melting around 86 degrees Celsius, which is kind of in between. Now, I don't have a true melting point apparatus, but this kind of does the job, so we kind of get a general idea. Well, kind of ran into a problem. We got 103.6% as the percent yield. Now, I put this powder into a desiccator for a couple days, and once the weight wasn't changing that much, I called it dry. Though, there could still be some slight water in there. Though, I really think it's just impurities that are in here, or unreacted piperin. Now, I calculated just enough ozone to be in slight excess for both of those double bonds. Likely, we need even more of an excess than I originally calculated. Now, they used one gram of piperin per 800 milligrams of ozone. 
However, their ozone was spread out over eight hours. I used 600 milligrams per hour over the course of eight hours. Now, I don't know how accurate my ozone generator was as it was a $54 one on Amazon. Now, if we were to base how much ozone we need based on one gram of piperin, we could just say it's one gram of piperin per 800 milligrams of ozone. This would mean that we're 5,304 milligrams of ozone short. However, our original weight from 12.63 grams went all the way down to 6.892 grams, which is quite close to our theoretical yield. Now, does that mean we actually need that much ozone? I'm not really sure. I would be extremely interested in seeing what this actual composition is. Though, I don't have the equipment, so either I need to find someone who does, or I need to ask my university. If anybody has any really good purification methods, or they know how to do this a lot better, please put it down in the comments. You can use it as a discussion board, and we can discuss better ways to do this. Now, on a personal note, I feel like I at least have some of it, because it smells so incredibly good, and vastly different than piperin. I just want to achieve a very good purity. I wanted to see if this would work if we could just use a calculated amount of ozone with a slight excess. But comparing this procedure, we probably need a huge excess. You see, I was hoping I didn't need to do that because I have to turn the dial every single hour and I really don't want to run ozone for 16 hours in a small shed. But potentially, here we are. I also want to give a huge shout out to all my Patreon members. I can't thank you enough for supporting the channel and just thank you so, so, so much.